dear Father in heaven. We thank you that you've gathered, gathered us here on this beautiful Sabbath day. And we just ask that we could really have your presence among us. Please hedge us in and let your Holy Spirit be here with us. We just want to do your will and serve you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we've got pretty much all the basics um, in place. And now what we're going to do is look into some more of the details of some of the finer points of how Josiah Litch's prediction actually worked. Um, we're going to look at some of the events that have been traditionally held as constituting the fulfilment of his prediction. And we're also going to look at um, another event which can, can tie in with that as well as a few more dates that can be connected with um, this, uh, mostly with the second way. So, <clears throat> we're going to stick with the, the structure that Miller and Litch put together. Hopefully a little bit neater and more clearly this time. So we're just going to continue on from what we put in place and we're going to look at part of the context which led up to the conclusion of the second woe which was August 11, 1840. So it's good to be aware of the dynamic that was existing in the Middle East at that time because this is the conclusion of what everything that we looked at, um, that was the beginning. So it's important to understand these things. I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of um, the situation with the Ottoman Empire at that point in time. So um, the Ottoman Empire grew to be quite a world power and it was the central state or called the suzerain. Um, we'll put that up, uh, the suzerain. And a suzerain is a dominant state which has a number of smaller states under its control. And these are referred to as the vassal states. So these vassal states are required to regulate their own internal affairs, but their external international affairs are all under the control of the suzerain. So we have the, the suzerain is the overlord. And 
and the vassal is the subject or the subordinate. So the Ottoman, so Turkey was the suzerain of all the little states um, in the Middle East, and one of them was Egypt. So as I mentioned before, Egypt was allowed to control its own internal affairs. However, it was required to pay tribute to um, the Turkish Sultan and also to contribute military support to whatever campaigns um, the suzerain state might have been wanting to undertake. But exercising the small amount of power, the moderate amount of power that they had, the Egyptians um, began to develop a sense of nationalism, a sense of Egyptian Arabic identity, and they decided that they wanted to break away and become their own independent state. So the leader of the Egyptians at that time, who was called um, the Pasha, Mehmet Ali, um, implemented a number of social and military and economic reforms, educational reforms, all modelled on Europe. He, he set the prosperity and the modernity of Europe as his ideal. And in a very short time, he was able to um, bring the country forward um, and they progressed and they were a more successful society than elsewhere in the Turkish Empire. And one of the things that they were very aware of, because they had to fight in campaigns alongside the Ottomans, they realised that their military reforms had given them um, an army and just military powers that were much stronger than the Ottomans. So they realised that it was quite feasible for them to break away from the Ottoman Empire and become an independent nation. So they commenced to um, see about bringing this to pass. So they began by taking Syria from the Ottomans. He used, Mehmet Ali used just a little quibble as a, as a um, excuse to invade. And that little quibble was simply that he had a couple of Egyptian citizens escape into Syria trying to avoid conscription. That was one of his reforms was um, conscription. And so he used that as an excuse to go in and just stomp all over Turkey's army and take Syria. And that's where it all started. Now, while that was happening in the Middle East, Europe was not um, ignorant to what was going on. All of Europe was watching and they were very anxious. Um, they all had their own agendas in the region and they were all wondering which way it was going to go. They could see that, that Egypt was capable of toppling the Ottoman Empire and just engulfing that and claiming it for themselves. And so, uh, this raised two concerns for them. It was their own enterprises in the region, but it was also the enterprises of the other powers. So they were trying to secure for themselves all the benefit that they could get, at the same time as try to prevent all the benefit they could going to the other powers. Um, for example, France actually had a lot of involvement with Egypt, and they... Um, were kind of allies. So uh, as all of Europe is observing this dynamic between the Ottomans and the Egyptians, it probably would actually suit France um, for the Egyptians to win. But for England, it would suit them to be able to limit Russia's involvement. So they want the Ottomans to stay in place so that they can prevent Russia from encroaching upon any of their activities. And Russia, in the middle, was trying to have it both ways. They were trying to um, have it set up so that they would benefit either way, whichever way it went. So it's all quite um, complex, but that's just a, a very basic overview. In the end, it all sort of went the way of Britain's intentions and the 
four European powers decided to interfere in order to prop up the Ottoman Empire so that um, the balance of power in that region remained the same, so Russia couldn't get um, the advantages that Britain was thinking that they were eyeing off. And we all know about the, the intervention of the four powers. We've all heard that. That's part of August 11. So we will go over that. I'm sure we're all familiar with it. But we have a few more little details um, to add with the understanding of Josiah Litch's prophecy. And it's really, we would call it telling the end from the beginning. So there's a number of parallels that we should understand. So we've got 1449, 1840, this, this is the second woe. I'm not sure if you remember, um, Josiah Litch had that quote where he said that there were the four Seljukan tribes which comprised the Ottoman Empire. And so he saw the Sultan as representative of four powers or four regions. So you've got four regions. And he also really emphasised the fact that there was no battle, there was no um, conflict, it was a surrender. The, the last Constantine just asked if he could reign, essentially. So it was, it was a surrender of power. And of course, it's versus one emperor. So when, when you track it through, on this side, you've got four European powers. Or we could call them regions, and that would make the analogy a little more um, accurate, if you want. You've got one sultan, and he surrenders his power into the hands of, of the Christian powers. So it was this dynamic here which Josiah Litch was expecting to be able to recognise at this point. And so in addition to the time period working, you know, finding these events occurring on, on this particular day, you had to be able to find this same dynamic which we know he did find. So he's talking about 1449. And again, we know that he had a slight error with, with um, his history in terms of what event he thought occurred on that particular day. But we'll, we'll quote him here. In the year 1449, John Palaeologus, the Greek emperor, died but left no children to inherit his throne, and Constantine Diakosis succeeded to it, that was his younger brother. But he would not venture to ascend the throne without the consent of Amarath, that's the Sultan. He therefore sent ambassadors to ask his consent and obtained it before he presumed to call himself sovereign. So you've got this surrender here. Let this historical fact be carefully examined in connection with the prediction above. This was not a violent assault made on the Greeks by which their empire was overthrown and their independence taken away, but simply a voluntary surrender of that independence into the hands of the Turks by saying, I cannot reign unless you permit. Judging from the manner of the commencement of the Ottoman supremacy, that it was by a voluntary acknowledgement on the part of the Greek emperor that he only reigned by permission of the Turkish sultan, we should naturally conclude that the fall or departure of the Ottoman independence would be brought about in the same way, that at the end of the specified period, the sultan would voluntarily surrender his independence into the hands of the Christian powers from whom he received it. So you see the same thing happening here. So I, I actually 
really like that quote that I just read. For me, that just sums it up perfectly. Um, and we'll, I'll, I'll, you'll, you'll see why in a second. Oh yeah, sorry. It's Prophetic Expositions, page 189. So as I said before, I don't quite agree with Litch that Constantine's surrender um, at this point marks the loosing of the four angels. We have a, a specific day. In terms of the year, it's correct. But uh, in terms of the specific day, it's not quite correct. But you can certainly see, leaving that specific day out of it, you can see that the manner of of the Turks ascending power was the same as how they lost their power. So that dynamic works perfectly. So the loosing of the four angels is the event that marks the beginning of the sixth trumpet. This is Revelation 9.15. But what we have here is in the year 1449, The, the, the emperor actually ascended on the 6th of January, whereas the sixth trumpet begins on the 27th of July. And when you read the verse, it's very, very specific that the duration of the sixth trumpet is that time period. It's the hour and the day and the month and the year. So you could not have the event that marks the beginning of the sixth trumpet occurring before that event. But there is still something that happens here. It's, it's not, it doesn't fail, it works. But that's, that's, that's just a little um, historical error. So we can address one very common criticism of Josiah Litch, and that is he's wrong to mark the Byzantines losing their independence here because history shows that this whole dynamic here, the four verses one, actually occurred in 1448. So we've got December 1448 is when um, the Sultan Murad was actually the, the mediator, if you like, who was sorting out this leadership crisis. So people will point to this and they'll say, you're wrong because it doesn't even fall inside the last year of the, the woe. It happens just prior. But this is essentially a fullness of the year error. Because if the first woe began on the 27th of July, 1299, and it ends on the 27th of July, 1449, <coughs> It's not starting at the start of the year, is it? So the, the final year would actually begin 27th of July, 1448. So it fits perfectly within that last year. It's there. So that's, that criticism doesn't work. Another common criticism is that um, it's wrong to mark a loss of independence here because the Byzantines had actually lost their independence decades prior. And that is also true, and it's also fine. It works. It's part of the prophecy. We can get rid of this. So actually, when you look at the history of both these powers, both the Byzantines and the Ottomans, you can see that they have ebbs and flows, um, you know, their dependence peaks and, and declines um, <coughs> over history. And that's fine, because what Josiah Lich has done, whether he really realised it or not, 
is he's lined up the perfect point where you find that exact dynamic. You know, whether it's a loss of independence or not is irrelevant. What you see is the four powers versus one here and the four powers versus one here. And I think that the primary justification that you have for tying these two points together is the fact that each one falls in the last year of its woe. So that's a good justification for lining up those two points in time. So it's irrelevant what you find, well not irrelevant, but it's not as significant what you find outside those two points in time when you line them up because that's where they align and that's where they match. And you'll find um, at this end there were times when <clears throat> there were five powers versus one and you know little quirks like that but this these two points the last year of the first woe and the last year of the second woe you line those up you find that precise dynamic and so that you know whether Josiah Litch was aware of that or not to me that's the best reason you've got for lining those points up comparing them and it makes sense <clears throat> so we'll look at, at an event commonly pointed to, um, used to try to disprove Lich. This event is commonly pointed to as the actual loss of independence. And it is it's in the year 1371, it's when the Byzantines... that's the Eastern Romans, that's the third part of men, became vassals of the Ottomans. This occurred in the year 1371. So that's definitely a loss of independence. However, it doesn't affect the prophecy. Because what you see and we're just going to have to squash this in a bit, sorry. In the year 1453, Constantinople was destroyed. And when you take this point here and connect it here, you've got 84 years So you can mark this initial loss of independence, an 84 year period and a total destruction. Then when you come out this side, this is after the end of the, this is on th from the very um, last point of the second woe, you can mark a loss of independence 84 years through to 1924 when the very last um, aspect of the Ottoman Empire was finally terminated and you've got 84 years, a, a complete finish. So that's part of the prophecy too. <laughs> it doesn't detract from the fact that at these two points you have this dynamic and the, you line them up for, um, because they're the last year of each way but more on all that later. But one, one thing though, which is quite interesting, because it's a chiasm, and this is the very end of the process, what you expect to see reflected on the other side will be the beginning of the process. And so that's important to bear in mind. But back to um, 1840, um, we, we all have a familiarity with the basics of the end of the second woe and we know why the Ottomans surrendered their independence but I think it's important to know how they surrendered their independence and there was a formal process to it and um, it was all based around a treaty and that treaty is integral to every single interaction that constitutes a fulfilment of um, Revelation 9.15. So it's an, an important treaty to, to know about. 
So we'll just put that up. So it, it was called the 15 July 1840 London Treaty. Um, we'll put it here. So part of this treaty, <clears throat> essentially what the treaty was, it was an offer of military support for um, the Turkish Sultan to be able to deal with his rebellious Pasha. If you remember what we said at the very start, Europe was watching all these events very closely and realised that um, the Turks could not withstand um, the Egyptians. And so they said that they would offer support. They intervened. <coughs> so basically the treaty was an offer of that support. It was a formal offer. And part of that was what is called the ultimatum. So they went to Egypt with two different separate sets of circumstances, which was the decider of war or peace. Um, they said to Egypt, you can give back Syria, um, you can stop trying to overtake the Ottoman Empire and we'll leave you alone. We won't declare war on you. And it was just things of that nature. So there were two offers. It was called the ultimatum. And this was what um, Turkey surrendered to. That's how they surrendered their power. Once they allowed this to be the case for Europe to intervene, they had no more say in the matter. So we'll just read about the quote. This comes from weaponsandwarfare.com. I'm not going to read out the rest of the numbers and letters. On July 15, 1840, Britain, Austria, Prussia and Russia signed the Convention of London, which offered Mehmet hereditary rule in Egypt, provided the North African country stayed in the Ottoman Empire and provided he withdrew from Syria and the coastal regions. Mehmet mistakenly believed that the French were prepared to side with Egypt and was consequently dismissive of British demands. Following this, British and Austrian naval forces blockaded the, the Nile Delta and shelled Beirut on September 11, 1840. On November 27, 1840, Mehmet agreed to the terms of the Convention of London, renounced claims over Crete, Syria and the Hejaz. So there's some interesting dates. <laughs> So we have two um, traditional events that we normally regard as fulfilling 1840. <coughs> so we'll just have a quick look at those. So one is the delivery of that ultimatum. So basically how it worked was Europe offered the support, Turkey said yes, they drew up an agreement and they said this is how it's going to work. We're going to give you this ultimatum, you take it to Egypt and see what Egypt says. If Egypt accepts it, all well and good. If Egypt doesn't, then we declare war. So it all hinged on Egypt's response to this ultimatum. So that was given to the Sultan in order to deliver to Egypt. <coughs> And <clears throat> the date that that ultimatum arrived in Egypt was the 11th of August. So you've got the delivery of the ultimatum. And we've got a few little, little quotes here to show that it was in fact delivered on August 11. We've got the London Morning Chronicle, September 5, 1840. And 
And it says, the arrival of Rafat Bey and Mr. Allison in the Bear Tahir steamer from Constantinople on the 11th instant. That means the, the 11th of that month in, that they're referring to. With the ultimatum of the four powers produced a great sensation here. So that's one evidence that the, that the ultimatum actually arrived on August 11. And the next one we have is London Morning Chronicle, September 8. And it says, <clears throat> during the interval of his absence, the Turkish government steamer, which had reached Alexandria on the 11th, that's August, with the envoy Rafat Bey aboard, had been or had by his orders placed in quarantine and she was not released till the 16th. So you've got, that's, there are so many newspaper articles that will show that it arrived on August 11th, heaps. That's, that's just two of them. So the other event that we usually refer to um, when we're talking about the, the fulfilment of August 11 is the Sultan's consultation of his ambassadors. And we have a quote for this too. This is the Times of London... August 20. It says, I can add but little to my last letter on the subject of the plans of the four powers, that's the four European powers, and I believe the details I then gave you comprise everything that is yet decided on. The manner, however, of applying the force, should he refuse to comply with these terms, whether a simple blockade to, is to be established on the coast, so this is in reference to the force applied to the Pasha, because he is refusing, well, not yet, but it, it appears that he's going to refuse the ultimatum. So that they're talking about what action they're going to take. Is it a simple blockade? or whether his capital is to be bombarded and his armies attacked in the Syrian provinces is the point which still remains to be learned. Nor does a note delivered yesterday by the four ambassadors in answer to a question put them by the port as to the plan to be adopted in such event throw the least light on this subject. It simply states that provision has been made and there is no necessity for the divine alarming itself about any contingency that might afterward arise. So this is the date that it was published but when you look, the letter is um, August 12th, is when the letter was written, so it written, and it refers to events of yesterday. So um, this is published, it's the published date. It was written on the 12th of August, and it refers to the 11th of August. So we can see that on the 11th of August, the Turkish Sultan inquired of his European ambassadors as to what was happening. Was it going to be a blockade or was, was, was the city going to be bombarded, etc. And he was told that the matter was out of his hands and he had no more say. Um, so there is no necessity for the divine alarming itself about any contingency that might afterwards arise. So his power to have any say in the matter was gone at that point. So that's why we mark the, Sultan's com the Sultan consulting his ambassadors as the second fulfilment of August 11. And this is the one that Ellen White, Ellen White refers to. It's GC 335. Um, point one. At the very time specified, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the Allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of the Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. So when Ellen White talks about August 11 being a successful prediction, that's what she's referring to. It's this letter here. 
But so we've always had these two, but there's been a third event that's come to light recently, and I. Um, I stumbled across this myself, but there's lots of people that know about this. There's, there's lots of people that hold this up as being a third event. And again, we've got to go back to <coughs> this treaty. Oh, sorry, and one more thing. So the delivery of the ultimatum, the ultimatum was a component of this treaty. And the, the um, consultation of the ambassadors was in reference to this being delivered. So everything hinges on this treaty. If you don't have that treaty, you don't have August 11. So here's another event. Um, and we're actually going to start looking at this treaty, looking at some, of, some quotes from it. We're going to look at Article 2 of this treaty. And it says, If the Pasha of Egypt should refuse to accept the above-mentioned arrangement, that is, accept that he's being kicked out of Syria, so if you won't come along nicely and do that, the Majesties engaged to take, at the request of the Sultan, measures concerted and settled between them in order to carry the arrangement into effect. In the meanwhile, the Sultan, having requested his said allies to unite with him in order to assist him to cut off the communication by sea between Egypt and Syria and to prevent the transport of troops, horses, arms and warlike stores of all kinds from one province to another. Um, they engaged to give immediately to that effect the necessary order to their naval commanders in the Mediterranean. So they're saying basically it doesn't matter what the Egyptian Pasha says, we're going to be prepared either way. We're going to have someone in place to stop them being able to make any more preparations for war. So they send someone there straight away. And here is a Wikipedia quote. In June 1840, Admiral Sir Robert Stopford, etc., um, sent Commodore Charles Napier with a small squadron to the Syrian coast. On August 11, 1840, Napier's ships appeared off Beirut and he called upon Suleiman Pasha, Mehmet's governor, to abandon the town and leave Syria, whose population shortly revolted. Open war broke out on September 11, when Napier bombarded Beirut and landed, effected a landing at Junia. So you can see that he arrived. This was Article 2 of the treaty. So Article 2 of this treaty was fulfilled <coughs> on August 11. So it's kind of like an earnest of what was coming on September 11. So it's interesting when you, when you think about it, there's things happening all over the place in fulfilment of this prophecy. You've got, um, you've got the ultimatum arriving in Egypt, You've got the Sultan consulting his ambassadors and you've got the British Navy turning up um, in Syria. So there's, it's, um, it's quite a big event. And so we can see that the conditions of, the, of the, this treaty were first fulfilled on August 11. Now there's something interesting about this treaty. It's what is known as a provisional treaty. Let me put that up. And it was actually the first provisional treaty in history. So what a provisional treaty is, is when they decide that whatever's going on is so urgent that they're going to wait, they're not going to wait to ratify, they're going to act immediately. And so we have a little quote here. It's from the Oxford Guide to Treaties. Page 230, 223. The earliest example of a separate agreement permitting partial application of a treaty prior to its entry into force, that means its ratification, 
appears to be the 1840 Quadruple Alliance Treaty for the Pacification of the, of the Levant. The parties wanted to act immediately to assist the Sublime Port in its struggle to regain control over Syria from Egypt, but they avoided saying so in the treaty, which was to be ratified. Instead, they signed a separate protocol of reserve stating that the naval, measures me the naval measures mentioned in Article 2 shall be carried into execution at once. So it's interesting that in the absence of a ratification, this event really stands in the place of that ratification. It was so urgent that they weren't going to wait. So that event effectively is the ratification of the treaty and they kind of rewrote the rule book in order to have that happen that way. It's the first time in history that it happened. So I think that's quite special. So <clears throat> you can see that 27 appears to be a theme of the woes. The first one starts 27 July, the second one starts 27 July. Um, so you can already see that it's a bit of a theme. Um, it's been a criticism of some people that August 11 doesn't seem to be a big enough event to fulfil prophecy. But when you look at all this, you can see that there is actually a lot happening there and there were unprecedented things happening there, which we don't, I don't think the significance was realised at the time. <coughs> but it's much bigger than we think. Um, and people don't like the date August 11, they don't like that event and they think that it kind of is out of step with the rest of the prophecy. But when you look at those 27s at the beginning, um, you can actually see, so you can use those 27s at the beginning to determine a 27 at the end. Because this was the 15th of July 1840. And between the 15th of July and the 11th of August 1840 is 27 days. So this event did not fall on a random day. That is a part of the prophecy. A lot of people like to say that this should have been the fulfilment or you know, this was the, it failed because this was the actual event. But when you look at it and consider that dynamic that we put in place um, before, which Josiah Litch was really strong on. You've, you've got those, those um, you know, the, the four versus one, the surrender over here, the four versus one, the surrender, etc. That happened here because that's when it was actually affected. It, during this time, Turkey could have chosen not to do it. They could have said, it's all right, we'll sort it out ourselves. But because they actually delivered that ultimatum on that day, that was their point of no return. Whether Europe ultimately intervened or not was irrelevant because the, the power was out of their hands on that day. So you can really see that when you look closely at it, this is far more significant than it might first appear. Another interesting thing, when you look at Revelation 9.15 and you can see that the time period given there is comprised of four distinct periods of time, you can kind of wonder why you have to go to the trouble of decoding it. Why couldn't it just be 391 days and one hour? Because that would work the same. You would still be able to convert that and get 391 literal years and 15 days but it's not given that way. We've got an hour, a day, a month, and a year. So you have to wonder the purpose of these specific portions of time that make up the whole period. <clears throat> so obviously they stand and they are relevant simply for the fact that they contribute to the greater period. That's all Josiah Litch did and it still worked. So obviously they're relevant for that reason alone. But yeah, let's, let's have a look and see if there's any purpose in the actual dates that they locate. Um, it's interesting that this treaty was so important, and it was, but there was actually a precursor to this treaty.
And I, I think that it supports August 11 in a number of ways. So the precursor was something called the collective note. And it was essentially the European aspect of that dynamic that we've already discussed. And that is that Europe was observing these things happening in the Middle East and was getting worried and was already preparing to step in. The collective note was an official note, much like the August 11 note that was delivered, where five European powers um, offered their military support. They said, we can see you're struggling with your Pasha. We are, you know, we're happy to step in and help. It was five European powers. So it, it was Britain, Russia, Prussia, Austria and France. So it's very, very similar to what happened with August 11, but it's five. It's five powers. So that event wouldn't have fulfilled the, pro the prophecy because it's the wrong dynamic as, you know, as far as what Josiah Litch put in place. But it was the same offer as the treaty. Um, we'll put it here. This note was delivered to the Sultan and he accepted it and signed it on the 27th of July, 1839. So it's interesting. We'll just take this out for a second. So if you were to add one more year to that, you would get to July 27, 1840. That would be a day. And then from July 27, 1840, if you were to add 15 days, you get to August 11. That would be an hour. So the interval that you have between these two points in time is one year and one hour. What does that remind you of? <laughs> Except in this instance, it's flipped around. It's like this. We've got hour, day. But it's clearly, um, it foreshadows um, the treaty because it's essentially the same thing. But it wouldn't constitute the fulfilment of that because it's got the five powers, not four. <coughs> However, it's still a part of it. So if we continue with this, <clears throat> if we work back <coughs> 30 days, which would bring us to the month, and it would be 30 literal years, we would come to the 27th of July, 1809. I'm just going to flesh that date out a little bit because it's important. because it's referred to in the treaty. Again, it's, it, it seems like most things are connected to the treaty, which was the 15th of July. <clears throat> so this is again a, a part of that London 1840 treaty. And they refer to this collective note and they say, faithful to the engagement which they contracted by the collective note presented to the port by their representatives at Constantinople on the 27th of July, 1839, and desirous moreover to prevent the effusion of blood, etc. So that this date is actually, this date and event is actually referred to in the London 1840 treaty. I might put it up again. And you can see that essentially it's, it's the same offer as the, the final treaty. But now let's look at this date. Did anything happen that is relevant to this overall line of thought 
on the 27th of July, 1809. So again, we have to go into a little bit of history of what was happening at the time. From the years 1807 to 1809, Britain and Turkey were at war. This conflict was set against the backdrop of the Napoleonic Wars and the complex machinations of the European nations that were involved. Essentially, Britain attacked Turkish war vessels near Constantinople because the Sultan would not accept an ultimatum from Britain, which included, among other things, the demand that Turkey declare war on France. So you've got this war between Britain and the Ottomans. So <clears throat> it's interesting that you've got the right parties in the right period as who you ultimately have, you know, Britain leads, leads all the events at this end. It's interesting that they're kind of threaded in down this, at this point. So the conflict was concluded with a treaty that was signed on the 5th of January 1809 in Chanak, Turkey. It was both a peace treaty and a commercial treaty, etc. Significantly, this treaty was the first to ever formalise the ancient rule of excluding foreign warships from the Turkish Straits. So we'll put um, ancient rule up. So, <clears throat> I'm sure you're all familiar with the basic geography of the Middle East and you've got those, pardon me, <coughs> those little straits between uh, Turkey and the rest of the Middle East. It's the Dardanelles Straits and the Bosporus. So, um, this treaty meant that Turkey was not allowed to permit war vessels in those straits in times of peace, which is, anyway, we won't go into all that. But that was a part of it. And that was the, that was the first time that that ancient rule was formalised. It had just been like a, a policy before that point, but at this point it was formalised into this treaty, it was the first time. So that was signed on the 5th of January, 1809, um, it was actually ratified, that is, made legally binding on the 27th of July, 1809. So we've got... Yeah. So we've got the ancient rule here. We've got the collective note. So the interesting thing with this ancient rule, um, it was first formalised at this point it was second formalised as the second aspect of this treaty in 1840. So what you have is 1809, ancient rule. That's the first time it's formalised. Then you pick up this other thread of, of the collective note. This is the military support. And then finally you have, in 1840, the military support and the ancient rule. So it seems that what's been happening is that you've been gathering threads which tie in into the ultimate conclusion. So I don't think it's any accident that you have this event on this day which ends up being a part of this final conclusion, this event on this day which ends up being part of this final conclusion. You got, you're kind of gathering also the parties that are going to be involved. It starts with the Ottomans and Britain, then it collects the rest of the European powers and it confirms it at this end point. 
but this, this is all part of, of the, this treaty here. So that leaves us with one day. So this would be the year, the month. This is the beginning of the day. Oh, hang on. Yeah. Day. Hour, that's when it starts and that's when it finishes. So we have one date, the 27th of July, 1840. So we have to see if anything happened on that day. And it's a little different, but I think something does. And what that is, is that in the British House of Commons, on that particular day, they were discussing the very events of what they called the Eastern Question, which was all this turmoil in, in the Middle East. So I have some quotes here. They're talking about things that were happening just prior. Um, so our reference is, <laughs> it's quite a complex reference. HCDEB 27 July. Eighteen forty volume fifty five. <clears throat> If anyone would read the papers laid on the table of the house, they would see that Colonel Campbell had distinctly guaranteed to Mehmet Ali, that's the Pasha of Egypt, the districts which he governed. And we'll go down a bit. His honourable friend said that the papers laid upon the table of the house proved that the English government had pledged itself to Mehmet Ali to support him in the occupation of the districts committed to his government and down a bit further, but it was clear there was in it an assurance of the British government to Mehmet, Mehmet Ali after the Battle of Kanaya that the British government would support him in retaining possession of the territories if he would not declare his independence of the Turkish Empire. So it seems like um, Britain kind of changed tact and swapped sides in, in some strange way. I, I know that it, that is significant, but I'm not entirely sure how at this moment. However, I also don't think that it's any coincidence that you have the very people who wrote that treaty discussing that those events in the House of Commons on that very day, which is right here, which marks the beginning of the hour of this prophecy. So we'll just say, Brit House Commons. So you have an event for every um, point in this prophecy, but only if you switch it. So it's listed this way in Revelation 9.15, but only if you run it this way. So that's the year there. So that kind of leaves us, however, with this date, because we just don't have the history to show, excuse me, that Constantine actually ascended the throne on that day. However, when you actually look at the verses, I think that you can see the solution. Excuse me. <clears throat> Go to Revelation 9, verse 12. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Verse 13. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God. Verse 14. Saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. So the golden altar is in the heavenly sanctuary, in the heavenly place. And it would seem to me that we get directed to that, to heaven at this point, because there is not going to be a recognisable human event 
on this day. So we've got um, holy place. So whatever restraint that the Lord had been placing upon the Ottomans for that the, the period of the first woe, whatever that was, you know, I, I would assume it would be angels kind of um, just restraining them somehow. But that restraint was lifted on that day. So we know something happened because we're directed to an event in heaven. But we're not seeing a direct um, outplaying of that event in human affairs on that day. We see the result of that further down the track. But I think that we're given that those verses just to give us the faith that something happens on that day. We just have to wait to see the result of it. And <clears throat> I think that it's the same thing with Daniel 11, 8, 14. You know, uh, Miller was thinking that the sanctuary was the earth and that th that event was going to be the cleansing of, of the earth with fire. And there was no recognisable human event on that day and they subsequently realised that that was the heavenly sanctuary. And so they were directed to heaven when there, when there was going to be nothing actually visibly happening on earth. So you can see that we've essentially got this laid out as a, a composite. Here's the first woe here, and this is the second woe here, but when you join them together, they're inseparable because they're joined at this point anyway. And of course there was an event for this, it was the Battle of Nicomedia. So then, if you look at it that way, you have an event for every single day. Um, and we listed those, those three events. When you look at it that way, you have events for every single date, and from here on, they all seem to be pointing forward and culminating in this event. So <clears throat> I like to put these in two categories because I think that it's, it's balanced to do so. I take the events which really seem to move the pro prophecy forward in human terms and I call them movers. So we have a mover here. This is a battle between two um, empires. Then we have this one here which is not discernibly... Um, an event, but we're told that something happens. So I'm going to call that a marker. This is the termination of a battle between, or a war, sorry, between two international powers. I'm going to call that a mover. This, again, is an interaction between international powers. It's, it's this initial offer of military support. I'm going to call that a mover. Here, we saw this discussion of these events in the British House of Commons, but there was no um, direct outcome. There was, there was no direct result. However, it was marked, so I'm going to call that a marker. And of course, the last events are clear. That's a mover. So when you look at it that way, you've got one, two, three, four events that are different from the other events. These four all share characteristics. Um, they're all international interactions and they're all um, spectacular events. They're, you know, they're major, um, major occurrences. So I think that what we can do with that is use the number four to track the downfall of this empire. You've got one, two, three, four, which we know is a, a symbol of um, a progressive destruction. So this is a little bit out of place, but this is the best place to mention it. I don't know if anyone's been keeping up with Theodore's work on 391.5. So <clears throat> I have found that that kind of um, confirms a few aspects of this prophecy. 
the, the main thing, which actually I found difficult to accept for a while, is the fact that it runs those periods of time in reverse. That's not how they're listed. That is, um, that's just sort of been uncovered by a study of the history. However, when you look at what Theodore has been doing, he's looking at... Nine seventy seven, um, and I believe that was the dividing of the kingdoms of the north and, and south kingdoms. This was the beginning of the siege. This is the end of the siege. And this is 1.5 years in between. So you can see that Theodore also puts his 390 period first and adds his 1.5 on the end. So for me, I found that to really confirm what I had been doing because I've, I was always a bit unsure about that. Um, another interesting thing is that when you look at this history of the second woe, they also split apart. It was the, it was the third part of Rome. So there was, there, there was divisions in the... No, sorry. It was Western Rome and Eastern Rome. So Western Rome came to its end in 476. But Byzantium continued for 977 years. Um... This is 1453. So if you want to use that as your starting point, 453, and you track forward 390 years, it brings you to April 1843. And 1.5 years later is October 1844. So this is, this is Byzantium. This, this is the year that um, Constantinople, pardon me, fell. So you've got a 977 and a 977th. I think that's interesting. <clears throat> Another interesting thing is when you go from 1449... I'm, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that, that you actually line these up, I'm just comparing them. Um, but from 1449, which is where we actually start the 391, and we bring it to this point, you've got your collective note, you can kind of see that the powers that are going to ultimately take over, um, they step up, this is where they first arrive. So you've kind of got... the besiegers arriving because they end up really taking the reins. So that's where they arrive and when do they actually affect that change of power? August 11, 1840 is when, um, as Ellen White says, you know, the, the power was out of their hands. And between there you have your 1.5 your one year and your half a month. So we'll just go like that. So you can kind of see <clears throat> a similarity there. This is where they first bring that, that message of interference and this is where they actually affect that interference. So we'll quickly conclude. <clears throat> We've looked at the 1840 treaty and how that is integral to all the events that relate to August 11. Um, We've looked at, at the traditional events that are regarded as fulfilling August 11. That's the ultimatum and the ambassadors. 
Um, we've also added a new event, which is the arrival of the British Army to Syria. We've outlined a chiasm connecting the beginning of the downfall of Eastern Rome. Mm, whoops. So we saw those two 84 year periods connected at, at the beginning and the ending of the second woe. And that's it, we can leave it there for now. I'll pray. Dear Father in heaven, we can only thank you when we see the wonderful ways that you are working in the affairs of men. And we can only pray that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear and hearts to accept. And we pray that you would guide us aright and not let our, our feet stumble. And we just want to commit our ways to you and leave everything in your hands. And we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.